Hello everyone, and welcome to The Darkest Hour. I'm your host, Amanda Jane. The holiday season is in full swing. Hanukkah has just begun. Christmas is right around the corner, with Kwanzaa and New Year just shortly after that. So, happy holidays, everyone. Normally, I take this time to say something spooky. Don't worry, I will. But first, I wanted to thank all of you for being here. Not just tonight, but for all the times that you've shown up and all the times that you've listened. This is our third Christmas special on the channel, which means that we've spent three Christmases together. And honestly, I couldn't be more grateful. I want you to know that I love reading your comments. You don't know how much those mean to us over here, the world. So, thank you so, so much again for all the love and support for the channel. Stay tuned all weekend because I've got some excellent things lined up for us. Also, if you haven't already, I'd be grateful if you checked out Scaredy Cat Radio's YouTube channel. I've linked it in the description and at the end of this video. We really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Now, I did promise something spooky, and I feel like it's about that time. So, let's get started, shall we? This is not a story I often tell. I sincerely promise that this has scarred me for life, and while I have investigated psychological and natural explanations for what I heard, they remain unsatisfactory. I was terrified of the dark as a child. I swear to my mother that I heard voices in there. They weren't evil, but they were unfamiliar, which scared me. It wasn't uncommon for me to wake up in the middle of the night and hear whispers, as I referred to them when I asked my mother. She assumed that they were just bumps in the night, typical childhood nightmares. I tried several times to convince her that it was more than that, that they sounded different from one another, in the same way that people's voices do. Some nights, I was so terrified by these whispers that I slept in my mother's bed with her. It was also convenient that the bathroom was right outside her bedroom door for those late night excursions. I should mention that when you walked out into the hall to use the restroom, you looked directly down the stairs that led to my living room on the first floor, as my mother's bedroom was on the second floor. I awoke one such night around Christmas with the need to relieve myself. As I walked out the door, I heard the word, Look. And to my surprise, a red light, almost like a spotlight, was cast upon the wall at the bottom of the stairs. I was transfixed by the light because it had no other source. I knew what this light was because I was a little kid, and it was only a few days before Christmas. Santa Claus. Who else could have gotten into my house and found out that I was being a good boy? I started down the stairs to greet him, picking up my pace after the second step as it started to creep off the wall and fade into the darkness of the living room. And that's when I noticed him. A powerful, masculine voice, in contrast to the first. It wasn't at all like my father's, though that's not to say he isn't masculine. It was just noticeably different. It stated, Stop. Right this moment. Return up those stairs. I listened, turned around, and what happened next is something I would not believe if told the same story. When I got to the top of the stairs, I heard a loud crash. This sent me running back to my mother's bed, where I jumped right under the covers and stayed all night. When we awoke the next morning, the poinsettia lights, small Christmas flower lights that glowed red, 
My mother had placed them on the railing down the stairs. They'd been pulled straight down. Some broken from what appeared to be a forceful tear and laying in a single pile. My living room's dry sink had fallen from the wall. My mother had no explanation. My father, though, was concerned that we'd been the targets of a home invasion. My sister was in tears. Nothing was missing. No one had broken in, and there appeared to be no reason for this to have occurred. And then I saw it. And I kept quiet about it because I was so afraid that I couldn't force myself to say anything. There were three indentations where the finish on the wood had been worn. Almost as if in a forceful grip on the edge of the wooden dry sink that had been facing up. Something had grabbed it and thrown it down. This was the source of the bang. I was embarrassed. I never heard another voice after that day. I don't like to think about what was waiting for me downstairs that night, if anything at all. But I can tell you that something had physically acted on two things in my house near the bottom of the stairwell. After that, I never heard another whisper. This is unfortunate because I would have liked to thank the man, masculine energy, who stopped me from falling down those stairs. This happened when I was seven years old now. I'm now 20 years old. I'm still afraid of the dark as a result of this incident. Especially dark stairwells. There's a period of my adolescence that remains fragmented in my head. Shards of memories sharpened from their breaking point. What lies beyond is a drop-off into blackness until I hit the next clear moment of conscious retention. The cracks filled in through stories my parents told me when I'd try to ask about the missing spaces in my mind. In elementary school, I was very hard to handle. A poster child for ADHD, with a mom and a dad too busy trying to make ends meet for me and my older sister. After one particular incident that happened at school, my dad had an after-school meeting with the counselor and school nurse. I sat in the office while they spoke in another room. Soon after that, I visited a mental health therapist who sold my parents on a product that he said was better than the other two leading medications. It rhymes with Rivance. By the next morning, I was on 70 milligram tablets with breakfast. I remember my day being a completely different experience. Each task I encountered was completed through the sheer focus of all my energy. The teachers were happy with my behavior and they seemed to reward me by showering me with compliments. Near the end of the day, my class went to the school's computer lab, a large dark room on the second floor with big windows overlooking the library. The walls lit with the dim glow of monitors. I loved this room's atmosphere, and the school had just gotten the new Apple iMac G3s in a bunch of beautiful, translucent colors. I was overjoyed when my efforts of the day granted me the job of closing down the lab. This meant that while the class lined up and dispersed out the door, I was trusted to stay behind and turn off all the computers, lock the door, and return the key to the office before returning to class. It was my first time alone with the quiet hum of electronics around me. I had a pretty loud household. My grandma was living with us, and she was always fighting with my mom. It was very chaotic. That moment in the computer lab, I'll always look back on as my first observation of peace and quiet. Midway through turning off the screens, I hear a voice say my name. I think it's one of the librarians, and so I get excited to tell them how I earned the closed-down job today. But when I turn around, 
I realize I'm still alone in the room. None of this scares me, though. Being a kid, my next thought is simply, hmm, that was weird. I return to my job and think nothing of it. But later that night, I'm on the couch with my sister watching TV, and I hear it again. An ambient voice calls my name, spoken from behind me. I turn around looking for the voice, but the kitchen is empty. That's when I ask my sister if she heard someone say my name, and she said no. My grandma was asleep in her bedroom, and both of my parents were at work, but for some reason... I still wasn't shaken enough to question the voice further. Even though I clearly heard Carly. It couldn't have been a passing car or a distant dog bark. It wasn't until a couple of months later that things escalated to a concerning level. Winter vacation had arrived and we had two weeks off from school. I'd still hear random voices saying my name... The voices would also quietly talk amongst themselves from time to time. I'd briefly tune into a barely audible conversation. Eventually, I stopped asking people if they could hear it, knowing the answer would be a repetitive confirmation that it was only me. Then, one afternoon, I'm playing Super Nintendo in the living room, sitting on the floor in front of the coffee table. My grandma is smoking a cigarette on the couch behind me. I turn around to ask her something, and I notice my Coca-Cola sitting on the table, opened and partially drank. I got upset because I'd purchased the soda earlier that day, walking to the gas station in the snow with the allowance I got for doing my chores. I say, Grandma, why'd you drink my soda? She looks down at me through the haze of smoke with an unamused glare, replying, What are you talking about? I elaborate, telling her I bought that soda at the gas station. Why'd she open it and drink it? She says, Don't be a dumbass, Carly. You know my heart can't do caffeine. I ask, then how did it get out here? And I watch her stoic expression... Mix with one of puzzlement. Carly, what the fuck are you talking about? You brought that out here, cracked it open. Her eyebrows stayed raised, and we share a stare into each other's eyes, unflinching from our collective sides. I turn around and continue playing my game, rolling my tongue around inside my mouth, searching for the acidic taste. My teeth feel chalky, but I couldn't convince myself I'd actually forgotten about it. Giving in to thirst, and without a word to my grandma, I retrieved my can of cola and took a sip, only to have the taste of flat soda meet my taste buds. The ring the can left on the table also indicated that it had been there longer than I'd realized. My grandmother was never one to confide in, She was there simply to make sure we didn't burn the house down, and she couldn't afford to live on her own. This lapse in memory was soon to be followed up by an episodic trope of waking blackouts. Taking the bus home from school, I'd look out the window and notice that none of the streets looked familiar, nor do the children occupying the seats around me. Somehow, I'd gotten on the wrong bus at the end of school that day. I was disciplined at school and at home because neither adulting party believed me when I told them I didn't know it was the wrong bus when I got on. I didn't even remember lining up for the buses at the end of the day. I was scared and hurt. No one believed me. Instead, they assumed I'd reverted back to my old ways. My parents requested the doctor up my dosage so I'd be taking one 70 milligram slow-release tablet in the morning and another 20 milligram tablet before lunch. This increase in medication, it brought the voices to a forefront in my head. Soon, their conversations would be directed towards me. I'd communicate back using my inner voice. My inner voice was distinctly mine and controlled by my thoughts, but along with it, 
adding to the monologue are three other voices, separate of my influence. Every time I'd think about telling someone, they'd quickly shut me down, almost like I was outvoted in the decision. Christmas Eve, I walk out of my room and I see the rest of my family has already eaten dinner, and they're now in the living room watching a holiday movie. They even lit the fireplace. My initial emotion is a punch to the gut. Does my family really hate me so much that they wouldn't even tell me dinner was ready? My bedroom is down a long hallway that leads directly into the living room. But before you reach the living room, you cross the dining room. I paused in the doorway and counted five plates sitting on the long wooden table. All recently used and dirtied by the night's meal. I turn back to face the living room and it's dark. The fireplace is out. Everything is off except the Christmas tree in the corner of the living room. I'm hit with a wave of dread that splashes me into a sprint back into my room. Slamming the door behind me, I dash to my digital alarm clock and it's about 2.40 in the morning. I lie in bed and try to collect a timeline of what I remember before a rush of exhaustion hits me and I fall asleep until Christmas morning. With the festivities of the day, I decide to hold off on expressing my mental health concerns with my family. After Christmas, the voices weren't present for a few days. Paranoia had me testing myself multiple times a day about remembering exactly what foot came after the next in my consciousness. Sometimes repeating the process three or four times to make sure I'd remembered doing it. This is actually what brought observable red flags to my teacher's attention, as I'd often turn in the same assignment four or five times. One afternoon before last recess, she had me stay inside. I thought I was in trouble again. Walking to her desk, I see that there's a spread stack of papers on her desk, all with my name on them, all copies of the last, paragraphs rewritten over and over, word for word. She pulls out more duplicates of other assignments and sets them in a stack next to the other papers on her desk. Then she looks up at me and goes, So, why are you doing this? Waving her hand over the pile. I was exhausted from the night before. The voices had been periodically visiting me again, keeping me awake with their negativity. I was only free from them for less than a week after Christmas. I don't know what triggered them to return. I don't know what triggered the initial disappearance. Standing at my teacher's desk... I'm too tired to think of anything but the truth. I didn't care if she thought I was crazy. I just didn't want her talking to me anymore. So I gave her everything. She sat there, wide-eyed, well past my claims. I was allowed to sleep in the nurse's office while my teacher called my parents, the counselor, and the nurse for an impromptu meeting. Momentarily awoken by my dad carrying me from the nurse's office to the car. I slept the rest of that day. The next morning, I was told not to take my medication, and we waited to see if the voices or blackouts would continue. A year with no occurrences passes before my parents decided to try to put me on another medication. This time, one of the trusted brands that rhymes with Scatterball. The bouts of hysteria, the blackouts, voices... They never came back, but neither did the blank pockets of time, pages torn from a chapter of my life, replaced by a handwritten memoir by the ones around me. My mom had bought a bunch of those disposable cameras for Christmas that year, taking all kinds of photos. We had the film developed at a kiosk in the mall. When we got back in the car, I sat in the back seat, pouring through the pictures the whole ride home. Images of my vessel posed and smiling, but without my knowledge. Candid photos of open-mouthed conversations I wasn't a part of. To this day, it still makes my stomach turn when I look through that family photo album and come across those Christmas photos. Though I still look at it 
from time to time. I guess just waiting for a memory to reinsert itself in my brain. So far, no such luck. This happened about a week and a half ago. My children and I were at my parents' house, playing in the front yard. The sun had just gone down, so the street lights in the neighborhood came on. My two-year-old thought that they were Christmas lights, so he took me by the hand, and he led me down the sidewalk to look for Santa. Now, I've walked through this neighborhood a thousand times. I know it like the back of my hand. Some family friends live in a house on the other side of the street from my parents, five houses down. As we were about to pass their house, I looked over to see if they were home. Where their house should have been stood a completely different house. Different cars parked in the driveway. This is a cookie-cutter neighborhood where the houses all pretty much look the same, and this house did not have a layout like the others. Before I had time to process what I had seen, my son pulled me around a corner onto another street. I kept trying to rationalize it in my head as we continued walking. Well, we never did find Santa, so we started heading back to my parents. We were about to pass the house again, so I reluctantly glanced over again, only for it to still be the wrong house. The wrong cars parked out front. I felt my heart rate increase. I picked up my son and I sprinted back to my parents. I had to pass that house again when I left to head home, but I was too freaked out to look a third time. One Christmas a while ago, a year after the death of my grandfather, my aunt and I were having a bad time coping with the first Christmas without grandfather there. We were both very depressed and had almost decided to pack in the entire holiday and let it pass us by. The night after our decision, I was woken up out of a dead sleep. I tried to figure out what it was that woke me. But after a few minutes, I decided I must have dreamed whatever it was. I settled in to try to get back to sleep. Just then, I smelled something I hadn't smelled in a long time. It was the smell of my grandmother's perfume. She died many years previously. The house we were living in, my grandmother had never been in, nor was there anything in that house to explain the smell of her perfume, which was so strong, it was like she was really there. After I smelled it, I was flooded with an overwhelming feeling of well-being, as if everything was going to be okay. I hunted around for the scent, but it faded as suddenly as it had appeared. Not being able to sleep, I went downstairs and I found my aunt doing the same thing. She had had the same experience that I had. My grandmother had always been a stickler for the holidays. Everything had to be done just so, all the way down to when the tree should be set up and what decoration should be put on, and we were late putting it up. It was like she was telling us that things were going to get better and that we just had to get on with life and be happy. We set up the Christmas tree the very next day. No one would ever believe me, but I wanted to share this story because I talked about it yesterday for the first time. Sorry for any typos, English is not my native language. I live in Northern Europe. My country is cold and covered by large forests and several lakes. My family consists of my mother, father, and an older brother who's three years older than me. He's really important to the story. It's also important to know that my parents' house, it's in the middle of nowhere, 
just forest around it. There aren't even proper roads or any streetlights. The nearest neighbor lives really far away. In my country, winter comes early and lasts longer than summer. So the days are dark almost all year round. My father is a fireman and my mother is a nurse. So they've always been on the night shifts. They had left me and my brother home alone since we were toddlers. I don't know if it's even legal to leave us alone, but my brother has always been really good at taking care of me. This particular evening was close to Christmas. Both of us were on winter break, but my brother still went to ice hockey practice. He was really tired that night after practice. Father and mother had gone to work at night and left us alone. I was eight at the time. My brother was 11. We often slept next to each other downstairs in our parents' bed, but I decided to be a big girl that night and sleep in my own bed upstairs. I really just wanted to play my Nintendo, and I knew my brother wouldn't let me. My brother was so tired after training, and he just wanted to go to sleep. We ate, brushed our teeth, and went to our rooms upstairs. My room faced the forest, and his room faced the only dirt road. There's a hall and a toilet between our rooms. My brother must have fallen asleep right away, but I played and played. I played for so long that I lost track of time. I was under my covers in case my brother came to scold me. I started to hear something outside. However, I didn't pay much attention to it at first. I've lived all of my life in the middle of the forest. You can hear voices from here all the time. The small noises, changes in sound. Someone started shouting, almost screaming. It sounded like a grown man who was wounded. I lifted my head from under the cover, startled, and I listened for a moment. I called out my brother's name, but he didn't answer. I got up from my bed and I ran to my brother's room. He slept soundly. I started rocking him awake. At the same time, I saw from his alarm clock that it was two in the morning. My brother woke up confused. Did you hear that? I asked in a whisper. My brother's eyes widened and all sleep vanished from his eyes. He sprang up. He didn't say anything. He walked towards my room. The shouting came from somewhere in the forest. We stood there together in my room and stared out into the darkness. I think someone needs help, I said quietly. But my brother's expression didn't change. His face was like stone. No, no one needs the help of two kids. Besides, if he needed help, he would be screaming, help. And then he turned around. He was right. I heard no words, just screaming. My brother walked downstairs and I ran after him. Our house has three doors. He tried each of them to make sure they were locked. He took our father's headlamp because it was the strongest light. Then he picked up the house phone. This was 2010, so not all kids had their own phones. He made sure all the lights were off and took my hand. He started to lead us back upstairs. Then he stopped. The shouting had changed. It no longer sounded scared or needy for help. It sounded irritated, almost angry, like it was annoyed that we didn't come out looking for it. My brother squeezed my hand and pulled me upstairs. He stared at my room for a moment before he pulled me into his room with him. He closed the door, sat behind his bed, pulling me into his arms. It was dark everywhere. My brother hadn't turned on the headlamp, but he had 112 ready on the phone. We sat there in silence. The sound had come closer until it was clearly behind the window of my room. We heard someone banging on the window. I started to sob. My brother stroked my head to calm me down, but it didn't help. I was so scared. 
the sound seemed to be coming closer and closer. It had climbed the fire escape under my window and was now traveling along the rain gutters towards my brother's window. Then it became quiet. It stopped screaming, but we could hear it clinging to the rain gutters to get closer to us. Then it was too quiet. My brother turned on the headlamp and pointed the light towards the window. Nothing. He turned off the light and waited a moment. Then he pointed the light at the window again. Nothing. Turned it off and waited. Pointed the light at the window again. Nothing. He turned it off. This time, there was a big crash, as if a pile of snow had dropped from the roof down to the terrace. My brother flashed the light in the window, and there was something on it. It was the kind of trace that's left when you breathe too close to the glass in cold weather. There was a trace of mist, condensation. My brother immediately turned off the light. Whatever it was, it had fallen down because my brother's window has nothing to hold on to. We started hearing moaning. It sounded only partially human anymore. It sounded more like a bear. If you've ever heard the sound a bear makes when it's been shot, that's what it sounded like. But it had a touch of man. Then the voice became angry again. It threw a full tantrum, started hitting the wall of the house. I squeezed my eyes shut, pressed my head against my brother's shirt. It raged for a while, but it started to whine and moan again. It no longer sounded human at all. I can't describe what it was like, but it didn't sound natural. My brother dropped the headlamp on the floor, hugged me tightly. We listened to the sound for quite a long time. I don't remember at what point I fell asleep, but I woke up in the morning. The beautiful morning sun reflected against the white snow. I was laying on my brother's bed, and he was sitting next to me, reading comics. He smiled. Had I been dreaming? I didn't have time to say anything when we heard the lock on the front door open. It was nine o'clock. Dad had come home. My brother cheerfully jumped out of bed and ran to greet Dad downstairs. Maybe I had a nightmare and went to sleep next to my brother. It doesn't sound impossible especially since my brother didn't mention it in the morning. I convinced myself that I had really seen a nightmare, and it just felt real. I believed so for many, many years. However, that changed. My brother came to visit me yesterday. Nowadays, I live in the capital of my country, far from my mother and father, because I go to university. My brother broke up with his long-term girlfriend, and I promised that he could bunk in my place as long as he needed. We had a lot of fun, just like old times. We drank some wine, we watched movies, and we just talked about everything. Then we started talking about deeper things, which usually happens after drinking wine. I turned to look out my window. Winter was coming, and it was already dark. It brought back childhood memories, I told him about a dream that I'd had when I was little, while looking at the street lamps outside. This darkness reminds me of when I had a nightmare as a child. I dreamed that someone screamed behind my window, and I hid in your room with you. Wasn't I a strange girl? I laughed, and I turned to look at my brother. My brother is now 23. He's huge. He's into bodybuilding and has a blonde beard. He looks a bit like a Viking, and I've never seen a look on him like that as an adult. He looked at me with big eyes. He was pale, like he'd seen a ghost. I freaked out a little. What? I asked, awkwardly. You remember that? He asked. It got quiet. What do you mean? Wasn't it a dream? I was so confused. My brother looked really startled, as if I'd dug up a memory from his mind that he wanted to forget. Answer me, 
I thought I had a nightmare. I was startled too. My brother shook his head. I thought you wouldn't remember that. You were so little. I hoped you would forget. My brother looked at me blankly and told me his side of the story. He told me how I had fallen asleep in his arms from exhaustion. He pushed me to his bed but didn't fall asleep himself. He sat up by my side all night like a guard dog. The morning had begun to dawn. The sound began to fade until it just disappeared. My brother still couldn't sleep. He decided to start reading comics to pass the time. In the morning, when father had come home, my brother had gone out to look for tracks, but since it had snowed all night and morning, all the tracks were covered. For the next week, my brother visited my room several times a night to make sure I was sleeping safely. We started talking about what had happened. Neither of us mentioned what had happened to anyone. I asked him why he didn't call 112, but he just shook his head. Who would have believed me? He was right. It would have sounded like a prank invented by a little boy. My brother also said that he was annoyed that he didn't flash the light to the window sooner. He would have wanted to see what the creature looked like. I was just happy that I hadn't seen anything. I'm also happy to know that I'm not crazy. It wasn't a dream. I have a witness. My brother experienced it too, and he remembers it better than I do. No one else has to believe me. No one else would believe me. Of course, it's also possible that somehow we created the whole thing in our heads. We have no physical evidence of what happened, and it happened years ago. It's very possible that we were just kids with an overactive imagination. I'm certainly not denying that possibility anyway. However, I'm interested to know, has anyone else experienced something similar? And if you have, did you see it? The creature? And if you did, what did it look like? My boyfriend of five years has crushed on me probably 12 or 13 years. He was two grades below me and he was a bad boy. While I was popular and was in honors classes, college level courses, so I wasn't really aware he existed until I met him at my dad's business about seven years ago. He apparently talked about me being his dream girl and was teased about that a lot, saying that it would never happen, which is why I mentioned this. In 2009, before we were together, my boyfriend and his best friend, Josh, were getting into pills. Josh's grandfather was an amputee and was unable to properly attend or understand hiding medication, thus leaving large amounts of methadone, clonopin, hydrocodone, and such just lying around. This was before the opioid crisis that had affected my generation deeply. In the last 15 years. Two days before Christmas 2009, Josh overdosed in the bedroom that my boyfriend is currently staying in. It's a long story, but we moved back to our respective families because we were laid off during the pandemic. We'd had a bad car wreck, losing our extra car, etc. The room has never felt spooky, never anything strange about it. But I've had a few pranks pulled on me that we believe Josh does to basically congratulate my boyfriend on being with the woman he waited for. I've woken up to sticky notes completely covering my body, my drinks poured on the floor, and random objects moved right where I exit the bed so that I step on them first thing in the morning. I swear I've heard giggling. Each time I've angrily asked my boyfriend if he was messing with me, and I'm aware when he's lying. He always says no. We like to think that this is Josh playing a practical joke. Sometimes he was known for that. But these are nothing compared to what Josh did for me in 2017, 
It wasn't a prank. It saved my life. Four years ago, I went into anaphylactic shock. I lost all ability to speak or move my lower body. I was upstairs with a curved, steep staircase separating me from my phone. I remember crawling to the stairs, knowing that it could be fatal if I smashed into the wall that the stairs led to before the turn with the very large, steep steps. I knew I was extremely oxygen-deprived, but I immediately saw Josh. They ascend the stairs and carry me to the living room couch with my nebulizer and cell phone. I called 911, but I had no voice. My friends were gone, except Josh. He told me that he was going to wake my boyfriend from the hammock in the backyard. And suddenly, my boyfriend dreamed of his friend saying that I was in trouble. My boyfriend came running into the house, and at this point, I was dying. I no longer could use any part of my body, and no air came into my lungs when I inhaled. I remember thinking of my daughter and praying that her father would navigate my loss to her and keep memories of me alive. He actually died in a freak accident eight months ago, so now I'm fulfilling that for him, but I digress. I struggled to remain conscious, but I was fading. My boyfriend saw the 911 operator on the phone and my sweaty blue body. He told them he didn't think I was breathing, and by some absolute miracle, there was an ambulance passing my neighborhood. The hospital and dispatch were 30 minutes away. This coincidence, plus my boyfriend's sudden premonition that I was hurt, saved my life. Josh and those EMTs saved my life. I remember the EMT asking my boyfriend if I had overdosed. I hadn't. And I thought of how Josh had died. I was blabbering on about dead people saving me after a large amount of epinephrine, so no wonder they thought I was high. The doctors and EMT were baffled at how I managed to get down those stairs or even stay alive long enough to get help. I had one bruise on my leg that was tiny. That was it. And the worst headache I've ever had. Turns out, I'm allergic to the latex and spray paint. I just told them I slid down the stairs, but it's not how I remember it. The weird thing is... I'd never met Josh when he was alive. I don't know how I recognized him or hallucinated him, but he looked exactly like the pictures I've been shown. I've had a lot of paranormal encounters, but my run-in with Josh saved my life, and he never even knew me. So, thanks, Josh, for giving me more time on this earth, and I wish that we had met many years before. I do hope that he's resting peacefully, just periodically popping in to check on us. December 23rd, 2000. I just flew in from college for winter break. It was a late arrival and I had to drive close to an hour home from the airport. After spending some time catching up with my mom and grandma, who were always night owls, I decided I needed to sleep. My room shared with my sister had been left unchanged. She wasn't there that night. It is now early morning, Christmas Eve. To set the scene, this house and room are small. It's a very small, one-level ranch home. The room was a box big enough for one twin bed on one side of the room and my twin bed on the other. Offset parallel, set up that the headrest or pillow area were opposite of each other and the ends of the beds overlap by a few feet. Basically, a head-to-toe format. There's approximately two to three inches between our beds. Anyway... From my bed, I can see out the door, down the hallway, where our bathroom was, and I could see just past that, to 
the beginning of the dining room. My mom and grandma stayed in the family room with the TV on, and this is just by the dining room. Again, small house. You can hear everyone and everything with little effort. Anyway, I roll to my side and I look over to the corner where my sister's head would normally be on her pillow. I see this odd white glow in the corner over her bed. I stay to watch because I get this sense it's okay, only love. In the past, with any paranormal event, I usually noped right out of there and was afraid. This white glow is in the shape of what I believe is an angel. I can see that it's tall. I can see a head, wings, not expanded, but the outline. Then I see a figure that's standing in front of it. This figure is white and glowy as well. But I can see two separate shapes. It steps out, places its hands together in a prayer sign and bows. It backs up and disappears. Well, reality sets in and what the hell did I just see? Frozen, now that fear has taken over, I yell for my grandma. Grandma? What? 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 Can you turn on the hall light? I just saw a ghost. She turns the hall light on and I remember her saying... 20 years old and still believes in ghosts and needs a light on. I felt mad at that point, for mocking me for believing in something she's had experiences with. Yeah, it was a family that say they believe in ghosts, but the minute one of us kids has an experience, it's not as credible, or it's just our imagination. I fell asleep and was awoken around 6 a.m. to the phone ringing. It was an unexpected call, and I hear my grandma talking to the caller, and she begins to cry. Her uncle had unexpectedly passed away in the night after having minor surgery to remove a small patch of skin carcinoma. He was in his late 70s. This was her favorite and closest uncle, the only one I knew that she spoke with. Now, looking back, it makes sense since... They were all about ten years apart in age. I never met him since he lived a few states away. Funny to only know someone by a few mail correspondences and phone conversations. My grandma would go to visit him as a break from us. I remember she spent most of Christmas Eve mourning in her bedroom. Family comes over in the evening, which are her sons, my uncles. I'm in my room and they're all at the dining room table, talking, and I heard my name mentioned, so begin listening. I hear my grandma talk about a 20-year-old seeing things, needing her grandma to turn the light on. They all laugh, and then I hear one of my uncles call for me. I go out to them, knowing what they were just talking about. He asks me to tell him what I saw. I tell them. Right as I was finishing, my grandma shoots up, and runs to her room, slams the door. She's crying. The focus is off of me, and my one uncle is at her door, asking what's wrong. She lets my uncle in. About 20 minutes later, he comes out and he tells my other uncle and I, very seriously, that my grandma is upset because she just figured it out. Her uncle came to say goodbye to her, the angel arrived the same time her uncle died, in the room she slept in when her uncle last visited many years ago. And his way of saying goodbye was with the prayer hands and a bow. There was no way that I would have known that this was his way of saying goodbye, the prayer hands and a bow, since I never met him in person. This is my story of how I saw an angel and someone saying goodbye to their loved ones. I feel like I robbed my grandma of one last goodbye. By chance, I was the one available to listen.
Well, friends, it appears we've reached the end of tonight's episode. But don't miss a brand new one every Friday night. Also, stay tuned for more content this weekend, Christmas Eve, and another Christmas special which will air on Christmas Day. Don't forget to like this video and share your thoughts and hellos in the comments. A huge shout out to all of my patrons whom I appreciate so very much. Tracy S., Monica L., Zoe Watt, Shelly B., Donald C., Rat Girl, Alicia S., Aaron G., Nikki H., Mr. Revenant, and Naz K. If you want to support The Darkest Hour in other ways, consider joining my Patreon. Check out patreon.com slash thedarkesthour, or click the link in the description to learn more. Do you have stories like these? I'd love to share them. Send them to me, Amanda, Darkest Hour at gmail.com, or on the Darkest Hour subreddit, The Darkest Hour, YT. Happy holidays and stay spooky.